We're beginning a three-part uh, series this morning called Treasure. Uh, what do you value? We want to identify the th three things that we hold in very high value as a church family, and we hope that that will help you better understand how we think about the life and ministry that we do together. But how about you? What do you really value? If your house was on fire, what would you try to grab on your way out the door? Or if you knew you only had a few months left to live, who would you want to connect with and what would you want to do? We're going to take these three Sundays to figure out what it is as a church family, what we value, and this is what I want you to know. We treasure people. Just write that down in between the title and the verse of Scripture that's written there for you. We treasure people. And the way we show that is something called hospitality. And uh, one of the things I love about Scripture is the depth of its theological wisdom and its incredible practicality. And this morning, we get to see something that's incredibly deep in terms of theology, but incredibly practical, something we can start doing even before we get out of the building today. It tells us in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, to keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, and do not forget to show hospitality to who? Strangers. Just look at the person next to you, and if you know them, then you do, and if you don't know them, they're a stranger. Okay? For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Uh, that's an interesting reference, and there's a numerous uh, uh, stories in Scripture where this has actually occurred, where angels come in disguise, incognito, and people through hospitality have benefited from the blessing that those angels brought. In fact, one of the first examples of this in all of Scripture is found in Genesis, the 18th chapter, to a man named Abraham. Up to this point in Abraham's life, he had been called by God to leave his country, to leave his ethnic tribe, to leave his religion, to leave his extended family members, and to go to a place that God would show him. And what God promised him is that if you do this, I will make you the greatest nation in the world, and all of the nations of the world will wind up being blessed because of your obedience to this. So he had to leave, and that meant that he had to travel. And if you traveled in the ancient world, this was not an easy thing. They didn't have GPSs and smartphones to give turn-by-turn -turn directions. They didn't have little rest stops along the way with fast food restaurants for you to be able to chow down some much-needed calories on your way to getting where you wanted to go. The roads were not paved. You could be at risk for attack from robbers and you were all kinds of susceptibilities and vulnerabilities as you went through this process of journeying. And so in this process of journeying, Abraham actually developed a heart to want to help other people who were also traveling. His, his hospitality quotient went up many times because he knew what it was like. So in Genesis 18, there comes this moment where God is about to release to him the promise that he had made these years before. And so God sends three angels in disguise. They don't show up with wings. They don't have special lighting or sound effects. They, they don't look any different than ordinary people. And, and Abraham is inside his tent, and he sees them, and he rushes out to them, and he invites them to come in. And what he tells them is, I'd, I'd like to get some water so that you can wash your feet. He said, I've got this tree over here that has wonderful shade and a nice breeze. You can sit there and refresh yourself. I'd actually like to bring you some food so that you can be strengthened. You can stay with us before you begin your journey. And they decided to do that. They took him up on his offer. And after all of this was done, the angels released to him the promise. They told him why they were there and what God had promised. And they said that by this time next year, you will have a son. There's this prophetic word that's given. And uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife, is in the tent, and she starts cracking up. She's just laughing. There's a reason why she's laughing. Her husband is 99 years old, and she is 89 years old. Now, I'm not anywhere as near those ages, and if I was told I was going to have a son or a daughter within a year, I'd feel overwhelmed. And Sarah just starts cracking up, and the angel uh, says, I hear that. You're laughing. And she goes, no, 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 I wasn't laughing. 
And the angel goes, yes, you were laughing. Oddly enough, the child was born within a year. And oddly enough, they named the child Isaac, which means laughter. Um, God is going to release this incredible thing, but this is what's fascinating to me. When it's time for the promise to become reality, what occurs is born out of hospitality. This is what I honestly believe. God likes to share with people who like to share. He knows that it will get multitasked, multi-purpose, and multi-used in multi-ways. And he knows many people will benefit. God gets very anxious when people hoard blessings and the good things that God gives. I actually believe that one of the reasons that Abraham wound up being the father of many nations, the one, one of the reasons that he was to be this one through whom this incredible blessing to the world would flow was just simply because he was a hospitable person because he was willing to invite people in and to share what he had. I actually believe if we want to see some of the most powerful promises that God can release to us and some of the most powerful miracles that God can do among us, that one of the ways to guarantee that God is interested in doing that is to be a hospitable church family because God likes to share with those who like to share. Now, let's go back. Remember when you were a very little child or when you were raising very little children, you told your children this law, this rule, and they were never allowed to break it. And I'm going to say everything but the last word, and you're going to give me the last word. Here's the rule, all right? Don't talk to... That's right. Why? Because you don't know the person. You don't know their intent. You don't know their character. You welcome friends. You welcome family members. You avoid strangers. And certainly children should not be going up to adults and starting conversations or inviting them to their house. This would not be a wise thing. But we should not assume that a rule to protect a child is the way to act as an adult. Our tendency is to avoid strangers. And the Bible says that we are to continue to show love to those that we are familiar with and who are family and who are friends. Show love to them. Treat them as brothers and sisters. But he also goes on to say, you should show hospitality to strangers. And I know what you're thinking, but I don't know what they're like. I don't know what they believe. What if they're a cat person and I'm a dog person? What if they're Republican and I'm Democrat? What if they're a Toyota person and I'm a General Motors person? I mean, you can't expect us to all get along together, can you? Uh, here's what you need to know. You don't have to agree with someone to be nice to someone. <laughs> I think I need to say it again. It just felt good when I said it. You don't have to agree with someone to be nice to someone. Look at how Jesus describes this. He says, if you, this is Jesus talking, the Son of God talking. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those that do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your, what's the next word? <laughs> you know, I just wish he hadn't put that in there. <laughs> Some verses he could have left out. Love your enemies and, and do what to them? Like just ignore them would be hard enough. But no, you're supposed to do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything to get back. Well, I can tell you right now, if I lend to an enemy, I don't expect to get it back. So that, that part I got down. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. God has been misrepresented by religious voices that are too loud but not too wise. God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. So be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. Aren't you glad God is generous with us? So when you are being hospitable, there's a couple of concepts that are very helpful for you to understand. And the first is that people are more important than things. 
people are more important than things. One time we got invited to a person's house in my father's church, and it was a beautiful home, and the meal was delicious, and the table was perfectly set. And at the end of the meal, my mother offered to help, and she picked up her plate and set it on top of my father's plate to take it over to the kitchen sink. And that's when our hostess lost it because you don't ever stack the plates on top of each other. We got the feeling that things were more important than people. Uh, you've probably noticed we go through an obscene amount of coffee, donuts, bagels, cookies, all kinds of stuff. We even have gluten-free stuff now for the gluten-free folks. And, this, and people ask me all the time, aren't you concerned that someone is going to spill coffee or drop one of those sticky, sugary, creamy donuts all over the ground? And the answer is, nope, we're not concerned. Because people are more important than things. I've even had people come up to me with great alarm, deeply concerned, wondering if we have any common sense at all. Why are you letting people into the sanctuary with food and drink? This is the Lord's house. You might be surprised to know how much eating went on in the Lord's house in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, uh, <laughs> I think the rule was, if you feed them, they will come. I really do. <laughs> and for the record, there are more stains on the carpet in this room from spilled communion than spilled coffee. So should we outlaw communion too? I do not think so. People are more important than things. Would you just say that with me, please? People are more important than things. But this is the second concept. People are not more important than people. You see, if someone treats another person in an unkind or disrespectful way, what you should know is that the leadership of our church takes that very seriously, and we address it very quickly. We require a change in their behavior. People are not allowed to be rude, disrespectful, unkind, demeaning, or destructive to one another in this place. Our world may be filled full of that, but there ought to be some place you can go where you are safe from it. And we want our place to be like that. So the command of Scripture is not to just avoid name-calling and hate speech. We're actually called to show hospitality to the stranger. If you don't know them, they are a stranger to you. I heard this great story this week. How many's ever heard of Airbnb? It's where someone can rent out a portion or all of their home to someone else who is in town and wants to make use of it. And so he tells the story how this first happened to him. He came across and met an individual who was going in the Peace Corps. And so they had gotten together for a conversation. He invited him out for a meal afterwards. And during the meal, he inadvertently, unintentionally, without thinking, asked him, so where are you staying tonight? And the guy said, I don't have any place to stay tonight. And then there was that awkward moment, you know what it's like. And he goes, well, I guess you could stay at my house or my apartment. And the guy said, I would love to do that. And so he brought him into his apartment. He blew up his little $20 air mattress. He laid it down on the living room floor. He gave him some linens and a towel. And, and he went back and he closed his bedroom door. And he laid awake all night thinking, I don't know this person. I brought a complete stranger in my How do I know he's going in the Peace Corps? He could be a terrorist for all I know. I might not live to see the next morning. Well, he did. And in fact, he and this man became very close friends. They're good friends to this day. Shortly after that, he actually lost his roommate and couldn't afford to stay in his own apartment. And his job wasn't uh, going to give him any increase, and he didn't have any other opportunities. He didn't know what to do. But at the same time, there was this big convention in town, and all the hotels were sold out. And so he had this brilliant idea. He would put online that he had an extra room in his apartment if someone wanted to stay there, and they could pay him a certain amount of money. And so he put it online, and sure enough, he got his first three guests to come and stay in his apartment. He thought, this is wonderful. And he got a business model idea. 
And so he got some investors together. And he said, I've got a great idea. You're going to love this. They said, really, what is it? He said, we're going to get people to post pictures of their most intimate spaces in their home, like their bedrooms and their bathrooms. And then we're going to invite total strangers to come stay in their house that they've never met. Don't you think that's a great idea? And they said, no, that's not a great idea. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. And yet it has become a multi-million dollar business. Why are we so afraid? Why do we assume that we cannot extend hospitality to strangers. When you began your educational experience, you probably went to a school where you were assigned a classroom and you were assigned a teacher who then assigned you a desk and a chair. If you were as old as I am, they actually had different size chairs and desks. And so I was always on the you know, uh, vertically challenged portion. So I always got the, the smaller desk. And, and, so, and, and, and sometimes they'd even put your name on it. And every, every day when you went in there, you would sit, that's your, that's your seat, that's your desk. You didn't go sit at somebody else's seat. That's out of bounds. You didn't go hang your coat in someone else's locker. Th that's your seat. And some of us have never stopped acting like we're in school as a child. And we come into rooms like this and we go, <laughs> excuse me, th that's my seat. <laughs> it's not your seat. It isn't. Um, one day, I mean, most of you know there's a little thing up here that's like a little desk uh, that looks like a chair, and that's where I throw all my stuff in the morning, and then next to it is where I sit, and one morning, one morning, <laughs> somebody came and sat there, <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it was kind of funny, but the look on the worship team, because, <gasps> and, and I know what they're thinking, what's he going to do? What am I supposed to, excuse me, <laughs> this must be your first time, because I'm like, if you'd ever been here before, that's my chair, that's where I sit every Sunday, I'm the pastor, unless you're going to teach today, go find someplace else, who, who would, by the way, do you think they would come back? No, but this is what we do, this is what we do. People are more important than things, and people are not more important than other people. And if you actually believe your chair is more important than the people who are sitting next to it or sitting in it when you get there, I give you permission this Sunday to take your chair home. And both of you can stay there. Because that's not what we're about. People are more important than things, and people are not more important than other people. In fact, I don't know if you realize... We've actually had, in the last two weeks, two babies born into this church. And in the next four months, there's nine more coming. I know. <laughs> what are we going to do? Our nursery is already overflowing. So we had this brilliant idea. Does anybody know what this idea is? What, what, we have converted my office into a nursing mother's room. In fact, if you want to see it when you leave here today, it's beautiful. They did an amazing job. Pastor, where, where are you going to sit down? Anywhere there's a chair. <laughs> because even the smallest among us should feel welcome in this space. Amen? Does that make sense? That's actually a, a biblical concept. And so we need to set aside our childish concepts of that's my space, that's my place, that's my chair, that's my room and adopt a concept of hospitality. Hospitality makes people feel welcome. In fact, let's look at what hospitality, how we want people to feel. By the way, hospitality is not what you do for someone, it's helping them to feel something, and we want them to feel welcome. If you want someone to feel welcome, uh, smile. <laughs> Everybody practice a smile and look at the other person next to you and ask them how it is. Just say, how, how is it? Okay. Smile, and, and, and inter if you don't know them, you can just say, hi, I'm Bob. Or, only don't use the word Bob unless your name is Bob. And, and then 
you can actually slide over and, and help them to feel welcome. I, I actually saw this, and I don't know if the person is here because I don't remember who it was. I just remember that it happened. But uh, it was in our early service. We have some chairs roped off in the back, and, and a person, you know, you know where preferred seating is in an auditorium in church, right? It's not like anywhere else. Preferred seating in church is back and aisles. <laughs> and uh, so uh, if you've been to our early service, it, it's not an overpopulated service by any means, so we rope off some chairs. And there was this, this row, and there were, there were two people sitting on the end of the row, and then there's a whole set of seats, a whole, a whole set of empty seats, and, and a person comes up. You know how they do. They come up in the aisle, and they just kind of stand there. It's their little signal of, excuse me, could, we, could you slide over or let us in? And the person turned around and said to them, you can take the ropes off the back of the seat behind you. I was standing there. I had a word for the, uh, from the Lord for them. <laughs> that is not how we treat people. Slide over. But, but, but I prefer to sit on the end, I know. But people are more important than things. And people are not more important than other people. And let's help them to feel welcome. I mean, if you went into somebody's house and you went to sit down, ah, don't sit there. That's my husband's chair. So oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And then he goes, oh, don't sit there. <laughs> and after the third time, you go, I, I think I'll just stand. Yeah. And then you're thinking, you'll never be back. Help them to feel relaxed. How do you do that? Do you realize that when people come into a place like this, they often don't have any idea what our service is like? Maybe they were raised in a church that's very different, or maybe they weren't raised in a church at all. And if you know somebody, this is their first time, like you said, hi, I'm, and you gave them their name, and they said, and you said is this your first time? And they say, yes. And say, oh, here's a couple of things you might want to know. We're going to sing a couple songs, and uh, we'll probably stand for that, and then kids are going to be dismissed, and then the pastor is going to teach on a passage of scripture, and uh, then we'll sing in, in, before we're dismissed. That little thing that you do right there helps people to feel relaxed. Uh, we want them to feel safe. That means don't ask overly personal questions. Um, you know, are you married? Why not? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I forget. I have two phones, and I don't always shut both of them off. So don't ask overly personal questions. Help them to feel expected. This is one of my favorite horror stories I love to tell. It was the early days of being pastor here, and we had so few people in such a small little building. We had so much debt and so little money that we just had to be very, very tight with everything. And there was one guy who took it to a level I didn't know. And so it was Communion Sunday. In case you don't know, the first Sunday of every month, we gathered at the Lord's table, and we partake in communion. And so he was preparing, he had prepared communion, but, but we're, he hasn't brought the trays back up, and I can't do the next part of the service, and, and I'm just, I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm, I can't figure out what's going on. Why is this taking so long? You know, do, did, did, did we have a medical emergency? What, what's happening? And that's when I discovered he, we, we had less than 20 people, so he had done like 20 little communion cups and, and 20 little pieces of bread, and, and we had like 25 that day, and he's back there pouring five more little cups. And I said, why didn't we have some extras? And he goes, I didn't want to waste the church's money. I said, just out of curiosity, how much do you think those little cups and <laughs> grape juice and, 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 and little crackers cost? Because, like, that's a very small amount. But when we make people feel like we weren't expecting them, like we're not ready for them, we do expect guests to come. And we want them to know that we've prepared things for them. Even like if you know someone's a guest, you can walk them out to the welcome center after we've got a little gift for them just for being here. And these are things that we can do to help people feel connected. Here's the surprise. And this is a huge surprise. The things we do to make guests feel welcome actually help us to develop spiritually. That showing kindness to strangers stretches us in ways that helps us to better receive and release the grace of God in our own lives. 
Hospitality is open. We can't share God's grace, grace if we're closed off from everyone. The grace of God is a treasure to share, not to hoard. As it turns out, God can't use closed hearts, closed minds, or closed hands. He has to wait for you to open them before he can use them. Secondly, hospitality is generous. We don't just want to share the spiritual things gifts of God. We want to share the tangible things as well. And as a matter of fact, that can get a little bit expensive. If you have someone over to your house, it's going to cost you something. If you take someone out to a meal, it's going to cost you something. Uh, in part of our budgetary process, we know exactly how much all those donuts and bagels and coffee cost us every single week. And some people may think that's an unacceptable expense. And what I want you to know, it's the cost of generosity. We, we don't just want to say you're welcome, but we want to show that people are welcome. Another way we show uh, generosity and hospitality, even to people outside of this, uh, you're going to see an announcement at the end of the service today about our oil change ministry. And if you are a single parent mom, if you are a widow, or if you are a service person in the uh, military, and you need an oil change, our church will change the oil and the filter in your car at no cost to you. We've got a whole day. People just have to sign up for it. That's all they have to do. By the way, in case you're wondering, this came up. Some people were wondering, is it only the men that can do the oil changing? Nope. If you're a woman and you want to change the oil, you can. If, you, if anybody wants to learn how to do it, you can. If you're a teenager and you want to learn how to change the oil, what a good idea. And uh, you, we're happy to, to teach you. That can be part of the day. So we want to be generous. We want to be respectful. See, our words can be gracious because we've experienced the grace of God. We live in a culture where people are not respectable. We live in a culture when the biggest laugh lines in any show is the biggest put down. And you should know that God doesn't think it's funny. I know it makes us laugh. But he sees what it does to the heart of the person who hears that. And just because they gave an awkward smile or a chuckle back doesn't mean it didn't hurt. This is what's true. If we don't respect people, we only have a pretend respect for God. Because every single person you've ever laid eyes on has been created in the image and the likeness of God. And on that basis alone, they are worthy of dignity and respect. It doesn't matter if they believe what you believe. It doesn't matter if they act like you act. It doesn't matter if they like what you like. What matters is that they're created in the image of God and they should be treated respectfully. We don't have to use disrespect just because we disagree. Be present. Hospitality is present. If we're too busy for others in our lives, we're just too busy. I've never met a person who was too busy for people that wasn't also too busy for God. I also have discovered this. People who make time for God in their life have time for people in their life. It's just an amazing thing. So be present and be outward focused. I'm losing a, I guess I'm missing a slide. Be outward focused. Hospitality is about reaching out to someone else. Now, there's a very big difference between hospitality and entertainment. And we are not here to entertain people. We are here to be hospitable to people. And there's a big difference between those two things. All right? Anybody ever hear of a wonderful woman named Martha Stewart? If you ever get a chance and you're invited to her home, I would go. Like, I'm thinking everything is going to be perfect. The, the, the way you, the, the home looks is going to be perfect. The way the table is set is going to be perfect. The food is going to be perfect. The decoration is going to be perfect. Everything is going to be absolutely perfect. And you're going to walk out of there and go, she is amazing. And that's entertainment. Because entertaining is when you want people to leave thinking you are good instead of wanting people to leave thinking they were welcome. When people walk out of this place, I don't want them to say, oh, that worship team, they're the best. Oh, that pastor is the best. We want to give our best, don't get me wrong. But that's not why we do our best. We want to show hospitality so people feel Welcome. And, and here's the thing you should know, and people wonder about this. They say, but what if we show hospitality and people don't change? Um, let me just take the pressure off of you right now. Hospitality doesn't change anyone. 
Our goal is not to change people with hospitality. Our goal is to make people feel welcome, and let's let the grace of God change them. We don't have to worry about being responsible for the change. We just have to make them welcome. And the grace of God has never failed. That's why they sing Amazing Grace. Never fails. Jesus himself, very hospitable. He washed his disciples' feet. He fed the multitudes. He, he said he was going to prepare a place for us. Jesus welcomed people to be near him, not pushed people away. And when we are like him, his grace flows through us. And this is what I honestly believe. God does some of his best work in rooms where people are hospitable because God knows you will share what he gives you. Now, if you were having somebody over to your house, there's a few things you'd probably do. This is a story I hate to tell about myself, but I do. Uh, my sister had a boyfriend I didn't approve of this many years ago. I didn't like him. I didn't think he was a good guy. And one day he came over to the house. It was summertime. The door was open. The, or the, you know, there was a screen door there, and he knocked on the door. And I was sitting in the living room. He could see me. I could see him. And I just sat there. <laughs> and I just sat there. I just sat there. And, and he said, excuse me, I ignored him. And, and he was very persistent. I'll give him that. He just, and finally, my sister comes out, and she says, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here. <laughs> so my boyfriend's at the door. I said, well, he's not my boyfriend, so <laughs> it's not my problem. And that is not hospitality. <laughs> you, you greet somebody at the door when they come in. By the way, before they get there, you probably spruce up a little bit. You get some clutter out of the way, the laundry out of the way, you know, you get the, the dog toys out of the way. <laughs> you just, and, and, you know, you, you make sure there's enough food. You, you do that stuff. And here's what I want you to know. Inside of your bulletin is actually a little card. If you wanted to join our hospitality team, you can greet people at the door. If you can be friendly and you can smile, you can greet. And by the way, if you're a person who doesn't like to stay in one place, we can even assign you roaming greeter responsibilities. We'll, we'll, let, you, we'll let you wander and be nice to people. It's okay. And, and, and one of the things at the bottom is like just a, a little clean and, and refresh up. You know, uh, the, the amount of trash we generate in a single service around here is actually pretty impressive. Just to have our trash baskets emptied or the bathrooms refreshed or something like that. I know it, it may seem like a demeaning task, and it's not at all. It's an act of hospitality. There's all kinds of things that we can do. and It's on that list. If that's something you would like to do, you're welcome to join us. Because we actually believe, please hear me, that when someone comes in here, though they think it's accidental, it's a divine appointment, we are not so much the gift from God to them. They are a gift from God to us, and they should be treasured, and that's what we want to do. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'm so grateful for the grace of God, because all the grace of God is, is how his hospitality is released to us. Every single one of us are going to be welcomed into the presence of Christ because of an incredible cost he was willing to pay. We're in the season of Lent. We're heading into Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. And all of that is all about God saying it's not good enough that they're not welcome. And so he paid an incredible price. You want to know what God values? He values people. And we think that if we're going to say we're a house that honors God, we should value people too. So Father, help us with this. Uh, by the way, not just when we're corporately here, but personally. Help us find ways to show hospitality to strangers. Not everyone will accept it. Not everyone will uh, benefit from it. But that can be their choice, not ours. Help us be people who freely give as much 
as we have freely received. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning.